not touch the kid. He had to be a hard nut to start a, a boy who was really programmed to go in the army. That was about it, you know. And you had to be tough, and you're not supposed to cry, and you're not supposed to show emotion. And I know Americans show more emotion, and more open than English people, but it's pretty similar over here. There's that Calvinist Protestant Anglo-Saxon ethic, which is don't touch, don't react, don't feel. And I think that's what screwed us all up. And I think it's time to change. Excuse that you're not a pop star, because I'm sure there are people that will listen to this interview. Well, I am. Well, Yoko was a poor artist when I met her, okay? And living in not the best conditions. And she had a child, and the child went wherever she went. She didn't treat her first child like that. She was mine. Stage, you know. She took her on stage, you know, I mean, little squirting thing. Not on the and she would take her when they were making movies, because I thought before we got together, I, I'd see her work and the way she worked. And the Kyoko was running around all over the place. And there are many artistic men and scientists that have worked like that in the past, not since the 60s, but in the 30s and the 80s. So even if I was poor, it's a state of mind that I would work out some way for him to be around us somehow. Okay? I would have chosen my career to suit that. And uh, it's not, it, you don't have to be rich to love your kids. And to learn from him too. You know, I learned a lot from, from the child because they're not hypocrites and they're not phony. And they know when you're putting it on the nose already. You know, I mean, already. I think it makes me feel. You know, or anybody with a child that spent any moment with them, you know. Uh, you know, and it's good for you. I think, because one does tend to fool oneself, and the kids don't buy it. Oh. Oh, yeah, this is because I hadn't been in the studio for five years or whatever. So he's used to me being around all the time. Because it's no, it's a pleasure for me to hang around the house. I was always a homebody, and I think a lot of musicians are, you know, they, you write and you play in the house anyway. Or as, when I was a, wanting to be a painter when I was younger, I was always in the house, or write poetry, it was always in the house. But so I started to work, you know, and I started to a bit less of me. I'd let him come to the studio, but it was a bit boring, he was excited, but... Long story short, at the end of the session, and it was going on, I got back on a night schedule where I'd be coming in and he'd be getting up, so he'd see me at breakfast, but I was a different, I was just sort of shredded, okay, what, oh, like that. And then one day we were sort of lying down on the bed together, so I'm maybe uh, watching some cartoon or whatever, and he just sat up and said, you know what I want to do? I said, you mean you don't like it that I'm working now, right? I'm going out a lot. He said, right. I said, well, I'll tell you something, Sean. It makes me happy to do the music. And I might be less, I might have more fun with you if I'm happy. I mean, I, I, was, I think I was BSing him, you know, but I, he caught me off guard there because he, I, just for daddy. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty straight, wasn't it? <laughs> right. myself of moving it back into the business and getting the one hand to hone in on yourself and never got to be in the business. had his picture up there all the time. 
in between the speakers. So whenever you listen, check in the stereo, he was looking at me all the time. I went through some terrible guilt, uh -huh. absolutely. Uh -huh. But I didn't want to put, put it on one side because I knew part of it was I needn't feel guilty. I'm entitled and I have to have my own space too, but I still kind of racked you. But at the same time, maybe we were giving him a space too. Oh, yeah, he needs a space because I'm always, you know, you know, when I'm not around, he relaxes more with Helen about how he eats and the knife and fork business. And I do tend to sort of want him to be a little gentleman and maybe it's not that necessary. And, you know, part of that English upbringing comes out. And I'm saying, well, that's American style of eating. That's fine. You use the fork. Now, if you're going to use a knife, you have to, you know, I'm Japanese where well, you use the chopstick properly. You know, don't kick him around and shove it around. And so he, he does need a break from me, too. Mm -hmm. And also, you see, as you said, I mean, a, a happy father is better than a, a grumpy father. Yeah, but I heard those women who were saying, you know, I'm going to fulfill myself by having a job, you know. So you mm. just, I wish there was a system where they had, you know, community daycare and places where they would be happy to be, not that you hoist them off like kindergarten. I sent him to kindergarten for a bit, but he was miserable and bored. And I realized I really, really sent him because I thought I'd get more space for myself. And he was not happy. I wasn't happy either because I wasn't using the space. I was thinking, what's going on? And am I doing this for the right reason? Why am I? There are some different kinds of schools, you can say, just to the bit. They won't be liberal more than the Well, he sees them. He knows what time they come off school. He's on that phone. Maxie comes back at 3.30. <laughs> He dials next door, and he knows they're coming home. So he knows there's only a few hours when they're all at school anyway. And his vocabulary is fantastic because he's been with children more, uh, grown ups more than children. And actually, they don't need that companionship till about six and seven. They can really relate to other kids. An hour together with other kids, all tension or, you know, who wants to be center of attention after an hour's play together, you usually have to split them up for a bit because they get. They're not really ready to allow each other space and have real friendships, although he has a real friendship with, his, with about three kids. But still, you know, six or seven is more important, I think, for that community thing. And I tell him, if he says, uh, you know, if he gets that bored feeling, I say, well, you know where your friends are? With two blocks down the street where they're at school. He says, yeah, I'll wait for four. Because he knows that all they learn is to sit still. You can put your door. Well, you see, if I knew the secret of what of what is right and wrong, but, well, I wish we all knew the secret. Nobody really knows. That's the point. Nobody really knows what's best for children, whatever. They're like guinea pigs that each generation experiments on. Now, I know if you go too far to the liberal side, they'll probably go up, go up being disciplinarians. If you give them too much discipline, they'll end up the opposite. I'm trying to just have no real heavy discipline about behavior, only you don't be impolite, don't hurt other people. And yes, you do have to clean your teeth after you've eaten. When you eat, you eat. And that, then you play after, not both at the same time, and regular bedtime. I think regularity is good. I, we did try to thing of let him sleep. When he wants to sleep, it didn't work. He, he enjoyed the freedom, and in that way he relaxed. But on the other hand, he started getting tired so, and, and whining. So but he no, has to be disciplined work. in a way, you know, because... Uh, oh, well, I do discipline. And you do. I never uh -huh. would hit him. So I always cooperate, don't I? And I always say, Daddy knows You're one best. of the best fathers he's ever had. <laughs> 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 well, you better ask for Daddy, no, because she's, he knows... She's still a, a, a real mother, because when it comes to the bit about who's tired and irritable, she can do with him when she's tired and irritable. I That's still find true. it hard then. To, to give and have him crawling over me on time. I, I need that rest to deal with him. The other thing that's very strange is probably... Are we talking about childing or refugees? <laughs> <is it? laughs> well, I mean, the funny thing is that there must be some sort of physical connection. And that's why, you know, I feel relaxed about it. I don't feel that even when he's far away, um, far away, I mean, it's upstairs, but I'm here to work. Um, that we're sort of connected and we know what we're doing. Because uh, he when buzzes he down gets, to the office all the time. And he gets further. The other day, I just suddenly woke up early in the morning, and I heard him cry. But I mean, I, 
it was just an instant after I woke up that he started crying. Mm -hmm. And I just rushed over. And there was that sort of feeling like I already knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Also, always that she never is, uh, however busy she is, she'll never stop him coming in. Even if he's in a really important business meeting, even if it, he comes in and she says, well, he sees that, you know, this would be boring if he walked in now, he'd have to check it out, and maybe interrupt a little, but it would be boring for him, so he'd go away, but so he knows his access to it. So in that way, we're lucky that our, our work space is within the building, but that goes for any artist, rich or poor, but they do tend to work in their own homes or lofts or apartments. So in that respect, I think a lot of people are doing do what we do anyway. Because if you work in the apartment, you're living in, it's all the same place. It's not a place where daddy or mummy has to go across town or get a commute every day. So in that way, musicians and artists have the a benefit that maybe ordinary people couldn't get. about getting the urge to make music again. Now. So it came over me all of a sudden, though I didn't know what came over me. <laughs> I know, like you were possessed. Yeah, I was possessed by this rock and roll devil, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, it's right there. Yeah, well, is that the question? Did I interrupt you? Uh, you got it. <laughs> Why suddenly and all that? Yeah. Well, partly because suddenly I got the songs, you know. You never know, you know. Those things just come to you. Just suddenly, like, had your pardon the expression, diarrhea of creativity. And uh, in fact, we went in the studio and cut about 22 tracks and so cut it down to 14 to, to make the dialogue. They were all dialogue songs, meaning that we, ha we were write writing as if it was a play and we were the two characters in it. But it's real life, but not real as well. It's on a song or a record, it can't be real. I mean, we could have taken it a step further and, and made this record so may maybe she would be called Ziggy Stardust and I would be called Tommy. Mm -hmm. And then he would call it a rock opera, see? But we always worked from our own selves as near as we could. So the, uh, the album, the work we did on the thing, is really a play. But we're using ourselves as a character. And what we sing about in the record and the song are, is a, are real diaries of how we feel. But also, it's always not really we feel, because it's a song and it's on a record. And you project it. Way. But we started this thing. And I started getting these songs. And I told her, I said, Look, she had, we had discussed going back to the studio, but I didn't have the material. But I wasn't worried about it. So I haven't got it for a long time. Maybe I, if I switch into that, there'll be something there. And it just sort of came. And I called her because I was in Bermuda with Sean. And she was here in New York. And I called her and I said, Well, look, uh, we were talking about recording. It must have triggered something off here because I'm getting all this stuff. And I started singing it to her down the phone or playing the cassettes. And she could call back two hours later and say, well, when you sang, sang that, losing you, or I, I, she'd come back with moving on or something. And then I'd say, oh, moving on, OK. And then I'd be swimming on the And suddenly something else would come, like, starting over. I'd say, hey, well, look, this is what happened. And it started working like coming out like that. So then I couldn't wait to get back. I suddenly had all this material. After not really trying, but not not trying either for five years, I've been so locked in the other the, the home environment completely switched my way of thinking that, that it, I didn't really think about music at all. My guitar was sort of hung up on behind the bed, literally. <laughs> and I just don't think I took it down in five years. inspired me completely I got as soon as she would sing something to me or play the cassette down the phone I would within 10 or 15 minutes whether I wanted to work or not if you call it work I would suddenly get this song coming to me and I always felt that the best songs were ones that came to you rather than I do have the ability to you know if you ask me to write a song for a movie or something and they, they say it's about this I, I can sit down and sort of make a song. That I wouldn't be filled with it, but I can make a song like that. But I find it difficult to do that, but I can do it. You know, I call it craftsmanship. I've had enough years at it to, to sort of put something together, but I never enjoyed that. I like it to be in 
inspiration from the spirit. And being with Sean and switching off from the business sort of allowed that channel to be free for a bit. You know, it wasn't always on. It was switched off, and when I sort of switched it on again, exactly what was question. So now we're already, uh, well, we did half enough material for the next album, almost half as much, and we're already talking about the third album, so it's full of vim and vigor. You can know anything, you just really You know, you go through two ways. Sometimes you think, wow, yeah, great, we, this is great, we've done it. And then the next time you hear it, well, she, she's not it's quite the same as Alvin. So I would go yay and nay on it all the time. But I think, uh, basically, we thought, we if it. people will exactly listen to it for what it. it is and not listen to it with preconceived ideas of how it ought to be or as compared to something else, then if people could listen to it just as if it wasn't even John and Yoko, just that it came over the radio and you accept it or not accept it as you hear it, not as you expect to hear John Lennon or expect to hear Yoko or expect to hear an ex people or expect to hear whatever, or having read some a good review or a bad review, forget about that. Just get it on the radio, I thought, and it'll be all right. Uh, the way I looked at it was probably, it's an album that's not going to do too well, but in the end, you know, maybe like two years later or something, people say, oh, that was good, because I knew that the theme was good, I knew the dialogue was important, etc., and each song was all right, you know. So I had a feeling that even if it takes a long time, people would know about it. You know. But it w I, I didn't know it was going to be that instant. You, know. you went out on a limb with this, though. You took yeah. a lot of very personal love songs and laid them out for everybody. Mm. How, how does that feel? How do you feel about, after five years of silence, bearing yourselves to people and interviews and music? Because, you know, even as I put it in my last incarnation, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. <laughs> It means really that, you know, one cannot be absolutely oneself in public because the fact that you're in public makes you, you have to have some kind of defense or whatever it is. But we always tried from, whether it's from Two Virgins through Imagine, through anything we've done together, the films we made together, always tried to get as near to the un uncensored, as it were, for what we are, not to get an image of something that we're not. Because having been in that sort of pop business so long, and tried to retain myself throughout it, but obviously not always been successful at that, it was most uncomfortable when I didn't feel I was being myself. You know, when I would have to smile when I didn't want to smile. And it became like all that, like being a politician, you know. And I, and what I really got through this five years is I'm not running for office. I like to be liked. I don't like to offend people. I would like to be a happy, contented person. I don't want to have to sell my soul again, as it were, to have a hit record. It's, I've discovered that I can live without, without it. It makes it happier for me. But I'm not going to come back in and try and create a persona who would not be myself. Does that explain it? After 10 or 15, almost 20 years of being under contract and having to produce two or three, two albums a year in the early days and, and a single every three months, regardless of what the hell else you do or what your family life was like, what your personal life was like, nothing counted. You just had to get those songs out. And Paul and I turned out a lot of songs those days. And uh, it was easier because it was the beginning of our uh, relationship and career. Paul and I developed in public, as it were. We had a little rehearsal, but mainly we developed our ability in public. But then it got to be format, and sort of not the pleasure that it was. And that's when I felt that I'd lost myself. Not that I was 
on purpose 